of Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, as we started with the Theodium, this spiritual journey, because this is what it is, it's a journey that we're all walking up to Jerusalem. We're all, all carrying our spiritual cross and trying to bring it up to the upper Jerusalem. Because this is our goal. This is what we are striving for, for life eternal. And the purpose of this specific period of the Chirodian as we started till the fifth Sunday, because pretty much the fifth Sunday is the last one, because next Sunday is Palm Sunday, which we are celebrating the feast of the entrance of the Lord in the Jerusalem. So, and after, al along with him, we will walk through his passion. So, and this Sunday is pretty much the last one that is dividing this, is pretty much our journey is at the end. And we're trying with all our strength to be prepared for this spiritual meeting with the Lord, to walk along with Him through His passions, and along with Him to raise up again and to receive the light of lights, to receive the life and guidance to our spiritual elevation. And as you see, he's preparing the disciples in this gospel that we just heard, literally telling them the details of what is going to happen to him in a few days. And after listening to what he has to say, two of them, John and James, taking him on the side, Lord, we want to ask you for a favor. So you see the attitude. So we, we want you to do something for us. Not even, not even begging him. Please, you know. But we want you. You got to do this, you know. You have no choice, pretty much. We're, this is how we are acting. You know, Lord, if you're not doing that, I'm going the other way, you know. So we're pretty much try, trying to make him, you know, to do our will. And uh, this is what we are looking for in especially our generation. A God according to our own measurements. So if no, we're putting him on the side, on the shelf, and let him stay there. We're doing our, our life, and we're taking our route, the way we want to live, right? It's amazing our approach. And why is this? First of all, we are seeing these disciples and the others, the other 10 got indig indignant, well, well, wait a minute. Like, you're stabbing us pretty much on our backs. You want the, all the power. How about us, right? So see, they, even though they witnessed these three years, everything what he has done, all the miracles, and yet they did not understand anything because they, they yet were looking for position, for earthly position. They wanted to govern because this was m the misinterpretation of the prophecies of the Old Testament. And who was interpreting the, the prophecies? The scribes and the Pharisees, those that were teaching the law. So, and this is for us also in our days because we have all the teaching of the Lord. We have the gospel, we have the prophecies. We have the revelations. And unfortunately, a lot of people in our modern day, this, they are trying to translate that. Specifically with the prophecies and the revelations. What is going to happen? When is, go when is going to happen? How many times people were prepared, waiting for the end of times? They, they sold everything and they were waiting 
dressed in white, waiting for the second coming. But we're not paying attention while we're trying to do that because he said no one knows, even the angels. They don't know. But he gave us some signs that will happen. We are seeing a lot of them happening. Are we close? Pretty much. But that doesn't mean that it's going to happen right now. We have to prepare constantly. That's why he said, you have to be ready at all times because you don't know when this will come. So that's why we have to live every single minute, every single day, like the last day on earth. Don't wait, oh, you know, I still have time. No, don't, don't wait for that because you don't know how much time you have in your hand. No one knows. Because the end can be partial or can be total. Partial to each one of us when the bell rings. <coughs> Come on, soul. Your time is up. <coughs> or total when the second com coming will be. But we don't know <laughs> neither one of them. That's why we have to be ready at all times. Not getting the evil ones ideas that, oh, you know, you're still young. You have a lot of time in front of you. So leave now, drink, have merry, party, and whatever you, else you want, and everything else will come when you'll be older. No, that's not, it's a wrong and very mistaken approach. So let's try to listen to the voice of the Most High God that speaks to, to us through the Holy Gospel, through the church, through the mysteries that the church provides to, for us. And so let us learn from this gospel. When they did this approach and this request to, to him, what he said, you don't know what you're asking for. Do you think are you able to drink the cup I will drink or to be baptized with the baptism I will be baptized? They said, yes, we will. And he said, well, okay, so you, you're going to receive the baptism that I will and drink the cup that I will, but sitting on my right or my left is not mine to give, but is our earthly father, which, and those places are prepared for those that he prepared them from the beginning of times. And what else he's telling them that these things should not happen among us, meaning the Christians. Because he said, the greatest of you have to be the last and servant of all, as I did. Even though I am your creator and God, I did not come to be served but to serve. Did you see any king to wash the feet of, the, of his slaves? No, but he did. And he is not just a king, the king of kings, the creator of all. Isn't this amazing? So the love that he shares with us has no limits only and I'm not talking only about the washing of the feet but to receive our flesh to live our life this is the greatest sacrifice from his side and ultimately willingly to go to, the, to his passion, because when they, he was talking to them, he made it clear that this is what I came for. That's the purpose, that's the reason of my incarnation. But they did not understand it. They wanted earthly positions. And so, so it's happening in our generation see our kids from school they want to be first they want to to rule over others to be in charge 
workplace. Some are running for mayor, some for governor, some for president, president of companies and countries and armies and so on and so forth. So to be in charge. It's not that God wants us to be without govern. No, but he wants the govern, first of all, to seek the truth and to govern in truth. So, but today we are seeing through these, through, through the steps that we are going, pretty much we are living a dissolute life without God, a faithless generation, as he said, oh, faithless generation. How long I'm going to be with you? How long I'm going to bear with you? And this is the reality. This is the true pandemia, lack of faith. This is what we are missing. It's not the economical crisis. It's the spiritual crisis. We left God. We left his commandments. We left his truth. We left his church. Everything. We turned our backs to him. But we are trying yet to find someone that is at fault. Oh, you know, the president, the governor, the one and another. But we're not blaming ourselves. But look, look at your body. How many elements your body has? You have hands, you have head, you have eyes, ears, hair, legs, and stomach, and heart, and everything, right? So if one part of your body is paralyzed, you're not fully functioning, right? So the same thing, the society. If one group is paralyzed, paralyzes the entire society. So it's not only then that we are not at fault. It's okay. They are different or whatever. No, we all are at fault because we're not doing our part. We're not helping the situation. And we, we cannot definitely, if we're just turning our head, oh, I, it doesn't affect me. It affects you. In long term, it affects everyone and everybody. That's why we have to stand up for the truth, no matter what. The truth cannot be changed, cannot be replaced. Because he said, I am the truth. I am the light. I am the way. I'm the light. He is everything, which cannot be replaced with anything in this world. What can you do to save your soul? Nothing. Only what you can do, you can do what he requested us to do. To love our neighbor, neighbor to be respectful to others, to use the talents you received from him for others, and to follow him. And this, the St. Mary of Egypt, it's a very big example for us. You see, Egypt gave us a lot of saints. And Mary is one of them. A young girl, she left her house just at the age of 12. The age of 12. Imagine, she left her family to live this dissolute life for carnal pleasure, for the pleasure of the, the, the flesh. But God's providence always bring us to the light. And this is what happened to, him, to her. When before the feast of the elevation of the cross in September, she came with that group to grow from Egypt, from Alexandria to Jerusalem for the feast of the elevation of the cross, she had a different purpose because she wanted to please her flesh 
during this trip. And the first part she did. But as soon as they got in Jerusalem and she wanted to go with the others to venerate the cross, an invisible force was blocking her, was stopping her. And now on this stay, staying on this side, she started reflected, reflecting on her life. And she realized that this is what were blocking her, her lifestyle. And he cried upon the name of the mother of God. Help me and I, I will do whatever you want. And the miracle happened. She went and venerated the cross. And she stayed there all night. She requested confession. And she heard a voice. Go on the other side of the Jordan River. And you'll be saved. So she left everything. She did not care about anything. Because now she saw the light. That spark. So this is what we have to do for that spark. And keep it alive throughout our life. Do not let it turn off. Because if we let that spark of the faith turn off, we're lost. So we have constantly to try to keep it alive. To keep it on. And this is what she did. She did. She went in that place. But guess what? Who followed her? The devil. Of course. He followed her. And when she was hungry, she will show, he, will, he would show her all these festive tables with different kind of food. She fight it chest to chest with him. When she was cold, he will show her this comfortable bed. Thirsty, different kind of wine, and other good things. But she did not give up. She was constantly fighting for her salvation. And there also was this higher monk, Zosimas, which he thought of himself, another temptation, that he is the best of all the monks from the monastery. So no one had reached his spiritual level. And then he heard a voice that look better and you'll find there are some better than you. And as the tradition of the monastery was on the clean Monday, the monks were leaving and coming back before the Saturday of Lazarus, that Friday before the Saturday of Lazarus. So they will take just some seats with them to for some dry, dry andidron, and uh, that, that would be it. And they will live in the desert for five weeks. So going there, towards the evening, he see, sees a shadow. First, at first he thought that is the evil one. He did the sign of the cross, but the shadow did not dis disappear. So he started following, and the shadow was moving. He started running. The shadow was running. He was running out of breath. He said to the shadow, stop. And the shadow stopped. And he was coming. He said, please do not come. But throw me your rasso because I'm naked. And he did. And she came and told him life, him her life. This is how we know all the details about her life. But see, today, both men and women, what is Saint Zosima today, and clergy and everything, to give us the rasso to cover our nakedness, because we are naked. 
you walk on the street. No, not only close to the beach, but everywhere. What we are doing, what we are showing to this young generation, we are poisoning them with our attitude, with our disobedience, with our uncleanness. And we're, we're, we're looking and asking who is at fault. You see that we are part of that problem. The problem is not there on itself, but we are part of the, of the biggest problem. See, like, in order to make a puzzle, there are many small pieces. So each one of us is a piece of that big puzzle. And we have to realize that. And we have to repent. Because repentance is the key. That's what we're doing this period from the beginning of the Triodion. And what repentance is. When we realize that we are at fault. That we are not so good and so perfect as we think about ourselves. So my dear ones, we have to call to mind. We have to dig deep in our heart, in our soul, to find the mistakes, to confess. Because confession is the result of repentance. After we realize what what we have and what we do, then the next step is the confession. When we are cleansing our inner world through the mystery of confession, is the, the bath of rebirth after the baptism. Every time we are confessing, we are washing our soul. It's that spiritual bath that each one of us has to take from time to time. And do not wait long time because it accumulates. You cannot wear a t-shirt forever. Usually we do one day, the next day you, you put it to wash because it's going to start smelling in a couple days. So if we would be able to smell the smell of our wretchedness, I don't think we will have the same attitude that we said, oh, it's fine, it's okay, well, when I will be older. No, now is the time. Do not wait for that. So let us prepare for that. Let us take this look within our side, soul, within our heart, and let us cleanse it. Let us prepare to finish this course to finish this journey along with the resurrected Christ to be able to celebrate this resurrectional festival with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all.